We are in Chemistry 201, College Chemistry 1, this time with Chapter 2, titled Atoms, Molecules, and Ions. In this particular chapter, we will see, uh, well, the, the very beginning uh, history of, of, of chemistry, how uh, the atom and then matter uh, started to be studied. Uh, then we will see like how atom can be expressed, properties of the atom, uh, about the atomic structure, right? The very, the very beginning, the very early stages of the atomic structure. And then we will see properties of the periodic table, parts of the periodic table, naming of simple, simple compounds. Okay? So let's get started with this chapter. Well, <clears throat> I would like to start saying that at the very beginning, uh, society didn't really want to explore that much about nature uh, because there were, there were different types of filters or, or problems around in the, in, in, in the world around that time. Religion was one of the most incisive regarding the limitation of chemistry. For example, organic chemistry was not allowed to be studied. Uh, the religion normally was uh, prosecuting um, any type of scientists, and then we know that they were normally like people was taken to the was like <clears throat> was really take to, taken to jail. Uh, the different type of uh, punishments that were applied that are to the so-called witches, right? So the first ones that were well trying to explain things in nature were Greeks, uh, one of the biggest societies in the, in the old Asian world. So they were explaining the, the changes of, of, uh, of matter, right? so how it will occur. So the alchemists, uh, they dominated all the, let's say like the, the history of the science for about 2000 years. At the very beginning, the Greeks, they were trying to explain the properties of matter based on four basic elements. The four basic elements were uh, air, soil, fire, and water. So they were saying if you see something in, on earth that is kind of liquidy, so that means that it has a higher proportion of water, less of fire, a little bit of soil, and then uh, they were competing with, I mean, they were basically combining the proportion of these four elements. Obviously, we know that that's not true anymore. Then in the alchemy, they were try, starting working with, um, with acids, well, for, for obvious reasons, right? So they were trying to come up with new, th new ways how to dissolve metals for the growth of the society. And then Robert Boyle, which is a name that's gonna come up again later when we study gases, he was labeled as the first chemist in the history because he performed a lot of quantitative experiments. So now that we're talking about the history of, uh, of, of chemistry, so there, were, there are three important laws which are called the fundamental chemical chemical laws. The very first one was, uh, was done by Lavoisier. Lavoisier was, um, was a chem, I mean, he worked in chemistry uh, research and then he had this law of conservation of mass, which later on will change to the law of conservation of mass and energy, but he started with the conservation of mass. So he said that mass is neither uh, created or destroyed, so it's only transformed. So if the planet was born with, let's say like one kilogram of matter, that matter is never gonna change, right? I mean, it's never going, the amount is never gonna change. I mean, you will have maybe one kilogram of solid, now let's say 0 0.5 of solid, 0 0.5 of liquid, but the overall mass is never gonna change, right? So that's gonna be important on the next chapter, chapter three, when we do the chemical reactions to do quantitative analysis. So mass is never destroyed or, or created. There is no way how we can create mass. Okay? Uh, the law of def, uh, definite proportion but by Proust, uh, he gave, a, um, he tried to say that uh, a particular compound has always a constant number of atoms. Let's say if we talk about H2O, right, water, we say, for example, water has a formula that H2O, Right? So it's two atoms of hydrogen and two of oxygen. So water is always going to have this proportion. Same thing with carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, we, we know, right, which is part of the respiratory system of our bodies. Carbon dioxide is always going to have one carbon and two oxygens per molecule. Same thing with water, always two hydrogens and one oxygen per molecule. No water in the world will have a different proportions. Right? So that is what the law of definite uh, proportion says, that the formula of a, of a compound is authentic, is unique for that particular compound. 
Next and last of the fundamental chemical law is the law of multiple proportion of Dalton. So what Dalton was saying that in some cases, um, elements, they combine to form different type of compounds. I mean, two same elements. The best example, well, I can give you two sets of example. We have water and we have hydrogen peroxide. Okay? So in this case, what is the proportion between hydrogen peroxide and water? You can see that in both cases, you have hydrogen and oxygen, but they are combined and mixed in different proportions. Same thing occurs with two gases that we should be familiar right, with. One is carbon monoxide, and the other one is carbon dioxide, right, which we had an example in the pre on the previous slide. So carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, they are both made of carbon and oxygen, but they are not the same compound. Carbon monoxide, is poisonous, right? So it is toxic for your body. And then carbon dioxide, no. Carbon dioxide is, is not toxic because it's a product of our metabolism. So according to Dalton, who, who had this particular law of multiple proportions, he says that when two elements from, uh, form series of compounds, right? In this case, they're forming two compounds, like right? carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, the ratios of the masses of the second element that combine with one gram of the first element can always be reduced to, to small whole numbers, yeah. So what he's trying to say here is that here, if we have a one, right? The multiple proportion is here, we will have a different, is times two. So it's, a, it's proportional, I mean, with small whole numbers, times two, okay? So there are some other cases, for example, sulfur, we can have sulfur SO, okay? SO is another example, actually this one is better. Sulfur monoxide, sulfur dioxide, SO2, it also exists, and we have even sulfur trioxide. So as you can see, they are, these three compounds are all made by sulfur and oxygen. But what makes the difference? Well, is the proportion is the amount of oxygen that is present in the, on the compound. And so here is times one, times two, and times three. So it's the multiple proportion. It's like they're always uh, associated uh, with, right, by factors of uh, whole numbers. So let's start with the atomic theory. So now that we know that mass is an important, it's an important thing, obviously the chemists, they were starting with mass. Before they started the study of the changes of the matter, they wanted to study first the matter. So they, it came at Dalton, Dalton theory. Uh, he came up with a few principles of this, of this particular, right, his study. He said that each element is made up of tiny particles called atoms, right? So at some point, I remember that I told you that uh, the, the Dalton was saying that if this one is a is a, is a matter, he if you cut it different right in a n number of times right. So let's say that I have now this piece and now this piece I cut it again, right? And you keep cutting, right? And you keep cutting the an object, let's say like a a billion or a trillion times you will be left with smaller and smaller particles every time, right? When you cannot divide that particular object any longer, right? Because that's the minimum expression, that's called an atom. Atom is the tiniest particle of an element or matter. There is nothing else that is less than the atom that has an identity, right? That's why here they clarify that it's an element. Elements, you the smallest, way how you can divide an element is to the atom, the atom which is authentic for the element. That brings us to the next, uh, the next principle which is that atoms, the atoms of a given element are identical. Okay? So that means if I have an atom of silver, this atom of silver is going to be exactly the same as a second atom of silver. There is no difference between these two atoms, that's why they are silver which we know right now, because now that we know everything about these uh, protons, neutrons, and electrons, definitely we know that these ones, they have, they're identical, right? So there is no difference between the two silvers. The atoms of different elements are different in some fundamental way or ways, different ways. So if, we, if I compare silver uh, versus, uh, let's say, potassium, right? These are both metals, but <clears throat> there is a reason why these two are different elements because they are not the same. Right? 
They can be different based on the number of protons, neutrons, electrons, and different ways how you can differentiate between two elements. But since they are different elements, definitely their atoms are going to be different as well. Mm -hmm. Chemical compounds are formed with atoms of different elements combined with each other. So a given compound will always have the same relative number, right? So we go back to the fundamental laws, right? So, so basically it seems like here Dalton, he took from the fundamental laws is that if I have, let's say, um, iron, right? Fe iron three oxide, don't worry about the naming, we will go over naming in a second. Let's say iron three oxide, this iron three oxide will always have the same formula. Whenever I said iron oxide, iron three oxide, it's always gonna be written Fe2O3, nothing else. And so if I'm talking about, let's say, sodium oxide, sodium oxide is always going to have the formula Na2O. Compounds have authentic and unique ways have to be written. There is no multiple ways to write the same compound. Okay? Chemical reaction to reorganization of the atoms, right? As I think I mentioned that on chapter one, that uh, since matter is constantly changing, right? The matter of the universe is constantly changing. So in chemical reaction, what we have is we break bonds and then we form new bonds. Okay? So it changes the structure, the sequence, some, somehow we are breaking bonds and forming new bonds. Normally those new bonds are more stable than the, than the original bonds. The atoms themselves are not changed in a chemical reaction. That's, that's also very important to, to, to remember is that, for example, if I have a reaction A, right, an element A that undergoes a reaction, right, plus let's say element B, right, I'm doing a chemical reaction here, right, so I will create A, B. So this, this, for example, this one is a combination, it's a combination reaction. They two, yes, these two single elements, now I'm forming a compound called AB. What happened with A? Did A get destroyed? No, A didn't get destroyed. A got mixed or combined or reacted with B to form a new compound. But what happened with the atom of A? The atom of A is still right here, still here. It's only that it's not A anymore. Now it's AB because it was combined in a chemical reaction. Right? So atoms, they don't get changed. I mean, you don't squeeze them, you don't lose them, you don't fragment atoms. What atoms do is they break bonds with another atom and form new bonds with new atoms. Okay, so now let's go over the, the theory, right? So now that, that uh, Dalton was already saying that, that the atom was part of, or, or is the, the smallest, particle of matter. So they were trained, uh, the scientists were trying to determine like how does it look like? So we want to know what is this atom? So it is like a, like a, a block, right? A building block. Is it like a Lego piece or is it like a sphere? Is a bead? Is how does it look like? Then there are three uh, different scientists. Uh, we will see the early stages. Right? So we're not finishing yet uh, about the atomic theory we will see the very beginning of the theory. So we have uh, Joseph uh, Thompson. Uh, he's one of the first ones, right? Is trying to study what is about the, the atoms. So he used, at, at his time, he, the electricity was already discovered. So everybody was playing with electricity. Right? So because they were noticing that electricity is a current of electrons and they're right, well, they didn't call it electrons back then, they just called it electricity. So they wonder where is this current coming from? Right? So he was using some uh, cathode, uh, cathode ray tubes uh, for the ones that are, I mean, for the ones that are a bit older, I mean, like maybe in your late 20s, uh, you, maybe you guys should remember that before having these flat screens, we used to have the big televisions that were, uh, had like a really, the back was really big, right? The big television, the one that had like a, like a hump, right? So those TVs were based on cathode ray tubes. So, because it is a flow of electrons and they have different fluorescence, so that's how you can get different types of colors, right? I don't know if you have seen that, that when there is no signal in, a, in, in the old TVs, not the current TVs, because they don't work with this, but the old TVs, when there was no signal, um, normally you see bars of colors, red, blue, uh, green, black, right? 
all all the colors of the well, not not the rainbow, but the particular colors you will see when there was no signal in TV. Now in the plasma TVs that we have, the smart TVs that we have right now, we don't see that anymore. Why? Because you don't have that that type of effect because you are not using cathode ray tubes. Uh, Thomson also determined a study about the electron, the uh, charge to mass ratio of an electron. And he also proposed that the atoms contain positive particles. Okay? So he definitely determined this. There is something negative and there is something positive. He didn't really call it uh, electron and proton, right? Not yet. Uh, but he definitely noticed that there is both charges are inside of the atom. Okay? So he, uh, back then, he didn't call it electrons. Now we know that it is electron. This is what a cathode ray tube looks like. So it's really like a discharge tube. Right? So you're putting current one way. I mean, you could here you have electricity. Electricity is flowing this way. Touches an element here, right? And that element is gonna be discharging electrons. Basically, now we know that it's electron. You can see that the, that the, the electron flow is going this way, right? Which is exactly in the diagram on the right what we see. Here, what we see is that the electron goes, I mean, goes from the negative charge, right, from the negative pole to the positive pole. So what did uh, Thomson did? He put like a magnet, uh, and you know that magnets, they have different poles, right? So he put here a magnet with a positive pole of the magnet. So what happened with that? He noticed that the electron flow shifted or deviated to the, towards, the, towards the plus pole. Okay. So this, this ray has color. So that's how you can see if it gets deviated or not. So he put a plus charge and then he noticed that the, the ray shifted towards the pole, right? Towards the magnetic field. That gave him a hint. Why is this moving towards the plus pole, right? The, the positive pole. Maybe because here this flow of current is negatively charged. That's how he determined. He tried the same thing with a negative. Let's say now I have a magnet, but now that magnet is negative, is, has a negative pole. So now when he was running the, the, the rays, now negative and negative. Now instead of shifting towards the, mag the magnet, it will shift to the other side. So, right, so against the, the negative pole of the, mag of the magnetic field. So that definitely gave him a hint. So where is this? Where are these electrons coming? I mean, where is this ray coming from? This ray is coming from the discharge, the discharge tube. Here is an element that is made of this, this matter, right? So matter is releasing some electrons, right? Or a flow of, of, of something. That something is negatively charged. Why is it negatively charged? Because it shifted with the with the plus, right? With the plus magnetic field. And it repels the negative magnetic field, like in this case, right? So here, he definitely noticed that there is something that is negatively charged in electrons. Okay? So something negative is in, sorry, in atoms. Atoms, they have something negative. More videos about this Thompson experiment, you can find it under videos and other audiovisual resources on Blackboard. So here, obviously, I cannot, I cannot really resemble, we have no video here for me to, to, to show, but the, the cathode tubes experiment is very interesting, as you will see it later on. When you guys take take a look to the take a look to the experiment, how how he did it. Then Rutherford uh, came later, right? So 1911. So it was that 19, the beginning of the 19th century was the boom. Is where everything got discovered. It is the glory of science and chemistry, physics, and biology. Well, no, maybe no biology that much, but chemistry and physics they grew a lot. That's when uh, radioactivity got discovered. Einstein started working in also a little bit later after Rutherford. That's when he started working. So that's maybe one of the best times for chemistry and, and, bio and physics. He explained the nuclear atom. This is an overview of what he did, his accomplishments. He also said that atom has a dense center of positive charge called the nucleus, and electrons have uh, travel around the nucleus at a la relatively large distance. Okay? So <clears throat> let me um, show you a diagram because this one is, is worth to explain um, the, 
forced to explain how Rutherford did this experiment. So he had a radioactive source. So basically he had like a screen that was radioactive. Okay, he had basically like a strap. And then here he put a gold foil. And then that gold foil was aimed by a alpha, alpha, alpha particle emitter or producer. Okay, alpha particles for the ones that are not familiar are, are positively charged particles, okay? so from radioactivity. Okay? So alpha particles are positively charged and then he worked with these alpha particles. So he was, he was able to produce that alpha particle in this particular box. And then he was shooting the, the alpha particle, okay? shooting through the gold foil. So from the Thomson, right, from the theory of, of Thomson, I mean, I'm going to put it down here. He proposed, I mean, the, the, basically the conclusion of his model is that he will have a solid, a solid mass, a solid matter, all right, that's what the atom is, that is all positively charged. And it has insertion of what he called electrons, okay, of negative particles. So that's why they call the Thomson. Thomson model, they call it a plum, plum pudding, right? So it's a pudding that has plums inside, which are the, the electrons, what we call now electrons. Okay? So Rutherford, he wanted to test that, what Thomson was saying. Okay, so if the atom is solid, like Thomson says, so that means that if I shoot my gold foil with alpha particles, it should bounce, right? Because if something is solid, right, it's rigid, it has like a, it's a mass of positive charge with electrons, so that means it should not be penetrated by the, by the alpha particles. Um, but that was actually not what he saw. He noticed that the gold foil, right, was actually passed through. But not only that, is that sometimes it will get deviated. Sometimes it will go right through, sometimes it will deviate in a different type of angle, and even it will go back to the source, which was even more important. So that was the, that was the interesting thing that Rutherford was discovering. So obviously Rutherford here put a fluorescent screen. Why did he put a fluorescent screen? Because he wanted to see, right, by fluorescence, where it was hitting, right? So by looking at the light here, right, if it's a fluorescent screen, so definitely you will see where it's hitting the alpha particle. So his conclusion was this like, okay, so Thomson was wrong. Thomson said that the atom is a solid mass, positive mass with, a, with negative charge inserted. I, this experiment is not telling me that. This experiment is telling me that the atom is mostly empty, right? Because if most of the particles are going through, that means that the atom should be mostly empty. And that's exactly what Rutherford was proposing. So if it's empty, right, your atom is mostly empty, that's why the alpha particle will be going through, right, passing through the, through the foil without being deflected. If you go close to the nucleus, right, since the alpha particle is positive, if it goes through the nucleus, it gets deviated. If it, the alpha particle hits right on the nucleus, it will get bounced back to the source. Okay? So that is what he explains. Like, since I'm using alpha particles, I should be hitting something that is also positive. The nucleus should be positive. Uh, there is no other way, because if this one is positive, how can positive right, bounce right, or get deviated? because it's, it's going right close to the to another something that's also possibly charged. So the ones that were going through, that was because the atom is mostly empty. That was his, his conclusion. So the atom is empty. I have all the plus charge that Thomson was saying that it was a solid mass charge. That's not true. All the plus charge is concentrated with what we call the nucleus. And then the electrons should be immersed in this basically empty space. This empty space is going to contain the electrons. The electrons are going to be here. Okay. 
but they they are going to be as as the 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 principle was saying right the the conclusion from Rutherford is that they will be in large distances. Okay? So that was the experiment that Rutherford uh, like the um, <clears throat> for the gold foil experiment. So the conclusion for Rutherford were this um, that electrons for, for found outside they are found outside the nucleus negatively charged then. Um, we will have that protons found in the nucleus, they have a positive charge equal to the magnitude of electrons they charge. Yeah, the atom had to be neutral. There is no way how an atom can have a charge, right? So the atom must be neutral. And then neutrons, neutrons are found also in the nucleus, no charge, and they have the same mass as a proton. So the nucleus is very small compared to overall size. That's why the gold foil, right? All the alpha particles will go in through the foil and the nucleus is extremely dense. Okay? So uh, everything is concentrated in the nucleus and it has most of the most of the mass of the atom. This is more or less the relative size of a nucleus compared to the atom. More or less to see it as a comparison in real life. Imagine the size of a golf uh, ball inside of a soccer field. If you put the golf ball in the middle of the soccer field, that's more or less the relative size of the nucleus in the atom. Okay? So the soccer field would be the entire atom, and then the golf ball in the middle, that would be about the size of the nucleus. As you can see, the atom is mostly empty, and everything is very heavy in the nucleus. Okay? So why is the atom protecting the nucleus so much? Well, maybe because all the information of the atom should be contained in the nucleus, which is, which is true. So the identity of the elements, they derive from the nucleus. So the purpose of having this electron cloud, as we call it, that empty space right here, this is called the electron cloud, this, this kind of pink uh, shadow, that's called the electron cloud. This electron cloud, it really serves as a protection to the nucleus. And we have the electrons here. But the mistake that Rutherford made is that he said that the nucleus, he didn't say anything about the nucleus. They were, he was saying that new electrons are moving randomly. They are not, they don't have a rhythm, they don't have a separation. All the electrons should be running in random directions and at random velocities and at random properties. Okay? So that's what the conclusion of Rutherford. That one was uh, obviously was corrected later on. Isotopes. Right. So after they they were studying the atoms, right? We were saying that atoms they have all the same identities. Uh, so atoms have the same um, atoms of the same elements. They have the same the same. They're identical, right? Except with the isotopes. Isotopes, uh, as here is the definition. Isotopes are atoms with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. Okay. So now I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to use my 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 whiteboard. Okay? So atoms are normally expressed in one, you know, there is a technique to express an atom. So let's use lithium. Okay? Lithium, that's the symbol for lithium. So normally you write lithium like this, you write lithium three um, and then it would be six, right? so it could be seven. Or let's say, I think that's too many. Four, let's say. Okay, so normally when you write or express uh, a particular element, you always have the symbol. You have here what we call the uh, atomic number. And here we have what we call the mass number. The abbreviation for the atomic number is the letter Z, and the abbreviation for the mass number is the letter A. Okay, so by definition, Z or the atomic number, right, is equal to the number of protons. That's the definition. But since we know that that 
atoms are neutral, that means that the number is also equal, going to be equal to the number of electrons. But that is a consequence, not always. I would say always use this comparison. Always Z number is equal to the number of protons. In a neutral atom, it's also equal to the number of electrons. Okay. Then A number. The A number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of electrons. Uh, sorry, plus the number of neutrons. Okay. So that's the formula to calculate the mass number. Okay. Uh, can I also say like A is equal to C plus number of neutrons? Yes, you can also say that. Can I also say that A is equal to electrons plus number of neutrons? Yes, you can also say that, but only in neutral atoms. Okay? You cannot use ions, no ions here. I will go over what are ions, so don't worry, don't worry. Okay? So it has to be neutral. Yep. So in this case, uh, for example, if they tell me lithium, lithium 4, 3, they tell me, I want to know how many protons are in here, how many electrons do you have in here, how many neutrons do you have in here, I want to know the C number, and I also want to know the A number. Yep. And they give me this. So uh, the atomic number is the bottom, right? The C number. So I have that three here, the atomic number, uh, sorry, the mass number, I know that that's on the top, so that means that A, A is gonna be equal to four. By definition, I'll know that Z is equal to protons and electrons, right? I don't see any charge here, that means that I can assume that this lithium is neutral, so that means that Z is equal to P, right, of protons, and also equal to electrons, okay? They are the same in neutral atoms. I don't see a charge here, so that's why I said it's neutral. And what about the, the neutrons? Uh, well, the neutrons, I know that A is equal to C plus neutrons, right? So if A is equal to four and C is equal to three, that means that number of neutrons is equal to one, right? So neutrons is equal to one. Do they always have to give me this? No, not necessarily. They don't have to give you the full thing. They have to give you the mass number, or they have to give you the number of neutrons. So let's say now that they tell me, oh, I have zirconium. Zirconium uh, 42. Okay, so now they tell me the same thing. I want you to determine number of protons. I want you to determine number of electrons, neutrons, C number, and A number. You might say now, oh, this is incomplete because I didn't get the I didn't get the the atomic number. No, but they are telling you zirconium. So what should you do? You should get your periodic table. By the way, I have you guys have this periodic table posted on Blackboard under course information, or you can get any of your periodic tables. So I'm gonna look for zirconium CR. CR is right here. And you can see CR, the atomic number, as here you see when the by the representation here, the atomic number is six, right? It's for carbon. So for zirconium, it's gonna be 40. So by telling you the element, right, the symbol, automatically they are telling you the atomic number. If they tell you the, the atomic number, by default, they are telling you the, the symbol of the element or the, of the identity of the element. You can see that all the elements, they have different atomic numbers, 22, 23, four. The periodic table, as I mean, we will go over the description of the periodic table later, but the periodic table is all organized based on the atomic numbers. One, two, three, four, five, right? One, two, three, four, five, right? All the way from, from top to bottom, from left to right, right? So that's how they all have different type, uh, different atomic numbers. No repetition. There is no way how you can repeat it in the periodic, in the periodic table. That is what makes an atom different from the other is the atomic number. So we said 40, okay? So even though the formula doesn't say it, but it's gonna be 40, right? They are telling me here the, the A number. So I don't have here for me the A number. The bottom number is gonna be 40. Uh, I don't see any charges. If I don't see charges, I mean that my atom is neutral. If the atom is neutral, that means that C is equal to both protons and also equal to number of electrons. Number of neutrons, well, I know that in A is equal to C plus number of neutrons, right? Therefore, A is 42 equal 40 plus number of neutrons. Number of neutrons is equal to two. So my number of neutrons will be here too. Okay? That's how do we complete uh, this, uh, this type of table.
Okay. Let's do one more example because I was saying that uh, we have to work with uh, neutral, right? Neutral species. So that is, let's say, there's something that we call the atoms, right? Which are neutral, but we also have something that are called ions. Ions are charged atoms. And, and since they are charged, that means that we can have positively charged ions and negatively charged ions. Positively charged ions, they are called cations. And negatively charged ions are called anions. Okay? For example, if they tell me uh, iron plus two, right? And they tell me, okay, so the mass, uh, the mass number is 50. Okay, the mass number is 50. Same thing. So they want me to determine the number of protons, the number of electrons, the number of neutrons, the A number, and the C number. Okay, each of them. Do they have to tell me the atomic number? No, because they're telling me iron. Okay, so if I go to grade table, iron has an atomic number of 26. So right here should be 26. So that's the C number. The A number is 50, right? 50 is right there, so A number is 50. Uh, what about the number of protons? Yeah, the number of protons, uh, that one is equal to the C number. No matter what, it's equal to the C number. So that means that this one is also going to be 26. What about the electrons? No, in this case, this one is equal to this. It would be also be equal to the number of electrons if the atom is neutral. But in this case, the atom is not neutral. The atom is charged. What does that mean, plus two? Plus two means that it lost two electrons, right? That is plus two. What if I have a minus two? That means that it gained two electrons, right? Depending on the, or depending on the charge, right? Gain two electrons from minus two, and then you have plus two, that means that it lost two electrons. So in the, in the neutral state, you should have normally 26, right? But this charge is telling you that the ion, right, or the atom lost two electrons. If you lost two electrons, that means that this one is not going to be 26. If it lost two electrons, it's going to be 20, 24, okay, because of the charge. The charge is telling you it lost two electrons, okay? And now for the number of neutrons, well, for number of neutrons, we have that A is equal to C plus N, right? So A is equal to 50, C is equal to 26, number of neutrons, number of neutrons is equal to 24. So 24 neutrons, okay? Again, we will do more problems like this uh, as a solve problem, right? So um, please uh, also watch this, uh, those videos that I'll be posting. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, isotopes, they, show uh, the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons, show almost identical chemical properties. Yeah, they undergo chemical, similar chemical properties. And normally in nature we have the, the they have, every, every atom has isotopes. What is the difference between isotopes? Isotopes are the same element, okay? So for example, here I have sodium, one type of isotope, and here's another type of isotope. They are both sodium. Why are they sodium? Because they have an atomic number of 11. Remember, the identity of an element comes from the atomic number. What is the difference between these two sodiums? That one has 12 neutrons, and the other one has 13 neutrons, right? So the atoms are not identical. They are not perfect twins, but they have the same number of, elect uh, same number of uh, in this case, number of protons, 11 protons and 11 protons. That is what makes two elements the same, is the number of protons, okay? So the number of neutrons is what changes, okay? So that's why they call it that an isotope is heavier. Heavier because it has one extra neutron or super heavy. So for example, I will stop sharing, okay? So, for example, in the case of Nate, right, in nature, we will have hydrogen, right? The normal hydrogen that we know, that we know, I mean, that, that is abundant in nature is hydrogen one. The other one is called deuterium. The third one is called tritium, right? So these are all hydrogen atoms, all hydrogen, because they're all one, one, one. But the difference is the mass number. The mass number, because they have an additional neutron. So this one 
they all form water. You can make water with all three hydrogens, but this is called water. This is called heavy water. And this is called super heavy water. Okay, so they have, they, they have the same chemical properties, the same reactivity, it's only that the, the, the number of neutrons is what is gonna, is gonna be, is gonna make a difference between these three elements. Okay? So it's the same element, right? It's all hydrogen. So the only difference is the number of neutrons. Okay? So other example of, of for isotopes, we have carbon, carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. Also three isotopes of carbon. You say like, oh, are they always gonna be three of each? No, no. Some elements they have only two, some other elements they have six isotopes, some elements have four isotopes. So this carbon, for example, has three isotopes. Okay? So it has different number of neutrons. So normally the neutrons number of neutrons are consecutive. For example, here I have six neutrons, here I have seven neutrons, and here I have eight neutrons. Right? So the number of neutrons changes just by units. I mean, you, you, you should never expect to see a difference in neutrons of 10 neutrons apart between isotopes. No, that's not the case. And so they are very close in, in number. If they are different, they are only different by, by, uh, by one unit or a couple of units. Okay? All right, so let's keep going with the lecture. Okay? So a central isotope contains 23 protons and 28 neutrons. What is the mass number? Okay, so I know that the mass number is equal to the number of uh, the uh, the mass number is equal to the number of protons or atomic number 23 plus 23 neutrons. If it's 23 plus 28, right? So that means that the uh, mass number should be uh, 50, 51, right? 51 right here. 51. The mass number is vanadium. Uh, how do I know that it's vanadium? Because the number of protons is 23. If it's 23, if I go to the periodic table, I look for element 23 and then I discover that it's vanadium. B. B is the symbol of vanadium. Okay. Chemical bonds, uh, now that we have that this, um, the nature of the atoms, right? So atoms, they form different type of chemical bonds. One of them is the covalent bond and the other one is the ionic bond. Covalent bonds, they form between atoms by sharing electrons. Ionic, no. Ionic, you have somebody gains, somebody loses. Okay? So be very careful, I mean, with this differentiation between covalent bonds. So in, in, whenever you form a chemical bond, it's always gonna be a fight between the two atoms. So, for example, I have atom A and atom B that they want to get together to form a chemical bond. So then they will do an agreement. Okay, so I don't want to lose my electron. And the other element will say, like, I don't want to lose my electron either. Okay, so then if you don't want to lose, I don't want to lose, then let's share the electrons. That's how they agree. Okay? So now another, in the case of ionic bond, one element says, like, I like to gain electrons. And then another element comes and says, like, I actually like to lose electrons. So they're a perfect match. I like to gain, you like to lose. Then I will take your electron, I gain, and you like to lose, then lose your electron, and then we'll form an ionic bond. And so that's the difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds. And so covalent bonds are formed by sharing electrons. Uh, you form a molecule, right? And the ionic bonds you have are actually the opposite, right? So you are not sharing. Bonds are formed due to force attraction. Yeah, because if you have an element that loses electrons, that means that that element is gonna become a cation. And then you have the, ele the other element that gains the electrons. So that means that you have an anion. What is that, what type of force is between an, a plus and a minus charge? It's a, an attraction force, right? It's oppos oppositely charged ions. So an anion attracts a cation. Therefore, you form an ionic bond. Ion is an atom or group of atoms that has a net positive negative charge. So it's a, it's a charge, right? Like, like as we were saying. Cation is the positive ion, which is the one that has lost electrons. And an ion is a negative one that gain electrons. This is the example I was mentioning before, right? So uh, what is the mass number uh, of the isotope? Um, here, mass number is equal to um, number of protons. protons plus number of neutrons. Okay. 
I have the number of neutrons, that's not a problem, 78. But I don't have the number of protons, I have the number of electrons, right? So that's why they give me some information. But I cannot assume that the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons because now I have a plus charge, right? So if I have a plus charge, that means that my atom lost one electron, right? So if right now I have 54, that means that the element used to be 55. How do I know it's 55? Because it is 54 after losing the electron. So that means that originally it used to have 55. So my mass number should be 55 plus 78. 55 plus 78, right? The answer, I'm gonna display it right now. Just let me finish writing. So it should be 130, uh, 133, yes, right? 133, right? 55 plus 78. Periodic table, so metals versus non-metals, uh, group of families, now we will go deeper on the understanding of the periodic table. I'm gonna show you the periodic table in a second. Metals versus non-metals, group and families, uh, very important periods of the periodic table. And then here's what we see. So the verticals are called the families. Groups of families are the verticals and they even have labels. So you can see here there is a 1A, uh, 2A, right? here have 3A, 4A, 6A. So there are different ways how you can label or, or name your, uh, your families. Um, some people, they just straight go 1 through 18 with non, non stopping. But the most conventional uh, way how to label your uh, periodic table is 1A, 2A, then here 3A, 4A, 5A, uh, 6 and 7, uh, and 8A. What happened with this middle block? This middle block normally is the B block. B block right here. Those are the transition metals, as we can see here. Okay, so just label it like 1A, 2A. Those are the most important. Those are called the representative elements. So 1A, 2A, everything that is under A, those are called the representative elements. Now, the division about metals and non-metals, right? So do you see this zigzag line that it goes across the periodic table, right? Right here, it, you see it's going from, right, from boron all the way down to a state, right? So this division line is the, all these elements on this side are metals, and all these elements on the right side are the non-metals. You can see that in nature, we have definitely way more metals than non-metals, okay? So even what are these elements that are at the, at the bottom right here? Those are called the rare elements. Rare elements, some of them are radioactive, some of them are not radioactive. But those rare elements, they are divided into lanthanides and actinides. Right? So those elements are really rare. So we find them in 0.1% to 1% on, on Earth. So they are not abundant at all. So all these other elements that are on the top, they are, they are good, they are very abundant. Okay? So no metals here and metals on the left side. What happened in the transition? What can I say about boron and aluminum? Okay? Boron and aluminum right, right between, right, right, right on the division line, same thing as silicon and germanium, right? Same thing as arsenic and, and antimony. Arsenic and antimony, here have also tellurium and polonium, right? So what is the name of these elements that are right between, right? Because there is a, it's right on the division. So they are called metalloids. Metalloids are actually elements that they have some properties of the metals and some properties of the non-metals. Right? So normally metals are like hard, right? Really difficult to bend. Uh, they conduct electricity, uh, they conduct heat, right? They have different types of properties for metals that non-metals don't have. For example, nitrogen doesn't conduct electricity. Oxygen doesn't conduct electricity. Carbon doesn't conduct electricity. Right? So properties of the non-metals are not shared by the by the metals. But what happened to the metalloids? The metalloids, maybe they have some properties, right? For example, aluminum. For the ones that have seen aluminum at home, normally they use it for frames of windows. Aluminum is not as hard as the conventional iron, right? Iron is way harder than aluminum. Aluminum is kind of soft. It's, it's softer, right? It's not soft, soft, but it's softer. So that kind of tells you like what happened with aluminum. Aluminum is a metal. Why it's not so hard as as right as iron or as uh, as copper that are really hard metals? Well, because aluminum is a non is a metalloid, right? It's in between, it's in transition. Same thing happened with silicon. Silicon is is one of the components of sand. Silicon oxide is sand. 
So silicon also is not is not hard. I mean, as as a metal, yeah, because it's not a metal. It's more on the no metal side. But still has it's still kind of harder than a conventional no metal. Yes, because it's a metalloid. Okay? So metalloids are right here on the intersection. Okay? Uh, okay? All this block right here, those are all the metalloids. Okay? And then this side are the metals, and the other side are the no metals. Special groups that are important to remember for the periodic table. Uh, here it says the alkali metals is the group 1A of the periodic table. The alkaline earth metals is the group 2A. Then we have the halogens, and we also have the noble gases. Okay? So never forget that. And the transition metals. Who are the transition metals? Those are all the ones in, in blue, in light blue here. These are all transition metals. Okay. Uh, properties of characteristics of these uh, of these groups, alkali metals, they always have a charge of plus one, right? So that means that they like to be charged plus one. The alkaline earth metals, they like to have a, a charge of plus two. Halogens, they like to be minus one. And noble gases like to be zero. They don't have a charge. What does that mean that so an element likes to be charged? That means that, for example, that alkali metals, they like to lose one electron alkaline air metals, they like to lose two electrons. Halogens, they like to gain one electron. That's why they are minus one, right? And then what about noble gases? Noble gases, they don't like to gain, they don't like to lose. Their charge is always gonna be zero. This one brings up like a very interesting topic. Say like, okay, I have somebody that likes to, likes to gain one electron here. And I have somebody here that likes to lose one electron. What happens with somebody that likes to gain meets with somebody that likes to lose? Well, they combine. The best example is sodium chloride. Sodium chloride, which is table salt, right, is made of an alkali metal, which is sodium. Sodium is an alkali metal. And a halogen is chlorine. Chlorine is a halogen. So these guys, they like to get together. That's why sodium chloride is one of the most abundant compounds, right? In, in, in ocean, in earth, right? It's very abundant, right? Why is that? Because it's a perfect match. Somebody that likes to gain one and somebody that likes to get, lose one electron. Right? So you will find these um, matches, I mean, very, quite often. One more thing that I wanted to bring back one, I mean, from the periodic table. Remember that we were saying that covalent bonds were, were formed by sharing electrons and ionic were formed by gaining and losing electrons. So an ionic bond is normally formed by a metal and a non-metal. Why? Because metals, they like to lose electrons. And non-metals, they actually like to gain electrons. So metal plus non-metal is going to be an ionic compound. Okay? What about for covalent? For covalent, you will have non-metals non with non-metals. No metal with non-metal, covalent bond. Metal with non-metal, Ionic. Uh, is it possible to form a metal with a metal? No, that's impossible. Metal plus metal, they never combine. They never react. Right? They don't form a compound here. Right? You wonder here? No, nothing. Never. So metal and metal, they never react. Because to form a chemical bond, somebody has to lose or somebody has to gain or share. In this case, two metals, they both like to lose. Then no, there is no... Uh, affinity between these two elements, right? two, ty those two types of elements. Okay, naming compounds. We are close to the end of this uh, chapter. Actually, that's one of the longest uh, <clears throat> sections, but we're towards the end. So in this particular section, we will learn how to name compounds. They are binary compounds and composed of two elements. Uh, we have also had the polyatomic, right? and we have the metal and uh, ionic compounds and also covalent compounds, how that works. Okay, so let's start with ionic compounds, the type one, which are the, easy, uh, the, more, the more straightforward to name. In this case, we have the, 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 let me maybe do it on paper, that would be better. So naming compounds. Let's start with the ionic. Remember, how do I identify an ionic compound? If I'm mixing a metal plus a non-metal, right? By convention, the non-metal goes last, 
okay? So for example, you will always see sodium chloride. The non-metal is chlorine, right? So that one goes last. It's wrong if you write it chlorine sodium. No, that's wrong. Normally it goes the metal and then the non-metal, okay? So for ionic compounds, we will use this table, okay? So the PDA table, here you can see clearly that the charges are on the top. These are the charges. Those are the ones that you want to, to use for the for your combination. Okay? You notice there are some elements, they, they only have one charge. But there are some other elements that they have two or more charges, like iron. Iron has two charges. What about man manganese? Manganese has four charges. What about vanadium? Vanadium has four charges. Okay, so let's divide the naming based on the monovalent. We call it monovalent because we have only one charge, one valence. Okay, monovalent, and then the or and then the ones that are polyvalent. Okay, polyvalent that they have more more than one charge. Okay, so let's start with the with the one that have only one, <clears throat> only one charge. So the metal has only one charge one possible charge. So let's say that I'm, I want to combine, what would be the formula of, I'm writing the formula of uh, potassium iodide. Okay, they asked me the formula of potassium iodide. Symbols, symbol of potassium. Symbol of potassium is potassium K. Iodide is iodine, okay? What is that? Why is that ending? Yeah, that comes in a second, but let's just, iodide comes from iodine, right? So Ki, so what am I gonna do now? Okay, I'm gonna look for potassium. If I see potassium has a charge of plus one only. What about iodine? Iodine is on the other side. Okay, so now I have a dilemma. I have iodine as a plus one, plus five, plus seven, minus one. Which charge should I use? Well, you have to use the negative one, right? Remember that you cannot use the positive because plus one and positive, they don't match. It has to be the negative. And the only negative charge for iodine is minus one. After that, you will cross the, the, the charges and you will have K1, I1, okay? Do I have to put charges, the signs? No. Do I have to put ones? No, normally ones are omitted. So potassium iodide is Ki, that's the formula. Okay. Another example, they tell me calcium, um, calcium fluoride. Same thing. Symbol of calcium, Ca. Symbol of fluoride, well, fluoride is really not the element, but it comes from fluorine, right? Fluorine would be the element, F. Okay, so charges of calcium, calcium is right here. It has only one charge plus two. What about fluorine? Fluorine only has the charge minus one. Okay. What should I do here? Well, cross, okay. if I cross Ca1, F2. Right. Can I simplify? No, I cannot simplify, right? So once I never written, then Ca, F2. That will be the formula for calcium fluoride. Let's do one that we can simplify. So let's do magnesium. Oxide, okay, symbol of magnesium, Mg, symbol of oxide, well, oxide is the, is the, is the ending, right? It changes the, ox the ending, but it comes from oxygen, right? Oxide, oxygen, charges, charge of magnesium plus two, charge of oxygen, what is the negative charge of oxygen? Well, only minus two, okay, minus two plus two, cross, right? Mg two O two. Can I simplify these numbers? Yes, half here, half here. Mg O. That will be the formula for magnesium oxide. Good. Makes sense. I'm definitely, I'm going to go more problems of this on my uh, solve problem videos. So I was going from name to formula. Let's do the opposite now. Now they give me the formula, and then I have to propose a name. So lithium sulfite well i just say the name my bad okay li2s okay so if i have this right this particular compound i have to return the 
the number well, here is a one. This one goes up there, this, this number goes up there. So lithium plus one, S minus two. The name for this guy is lithium. Always double check that the charge matches, right? Li plus one, yes, Li plus one. Lithium can be plus one. S minus two is called sulfite. Okay. Why sulfite, right? So minus two. It also has plus four and plus six, but we use the minus two because we have to use the minus charge. So the element is called sulfur. Why do you call it sulfite? Okay. So the, call, the, the compound is called sulfite because any time that an, an, element, an element becomes an anion, the ending changes. Right? So you add the ending IBE. So that means that you have nitrogen, Nitrogen would be the neutral, right? But if nitrogen becomes negative, now it changes to the to the ending nitrite. Same thing as sulfur. This is sulfur, S, neutral S. But once sulfur becomes an anion, now it changes the ending to sulfite. It's the, the ending for an anion. Carions, do they also have this ending? Carions, they have no ending, no change. Okay, the only ones that change the ending are the anions. Anions use the IDE. Okay, so that's how you can come up with, for example, in this case, right? This one will be a carbide, okay? a nitrite, oxide, sulfite phosphite, selenite, fluorite, chloride, bromide, iodide. Okay? So remember, these are all the known metals, right? So here is, here, right here is the division line. I'm gonna do it with a different color. Do with your periodic table whatever you want, of course, right? So here, whatever division, for example, this one is my metal and non metal division, right? So these are the known metals. So these are the ones that are gonna change. Forget about the noble gases. The noble gases, they don't count, right? So don't, don't, don't even look at this last column. So these are all my known metals okay, for combination. I mean, noble gases are also known metals, but they don't react. So that's, that's the, so this is the, don't even worry about, oh, should I form like neonite? No, there is no neonite. Why? Because neon doesn't have a charge, right? We say that neon doesn't, Noble gases, they don't like to mix, they don't react. So carbide, nitride, phosphide, sulfide, oxide, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Okay. Those are the conventional anions. Good. Okay, so now let's continue with more examples of how to do the naming. <clears throat> now we have the second type of metals, right? So metals that have multiple charges. What to do with these guys that have multiple charges, right? So let's do again the same. So let's go first by, let's do the opposite. Now let's go first from this formula and then the name, right? Formula to name. So first is naming. They call it naming or nomenclature, right? Nomenclature is also another way how these. You might see that on the internet, naming or nomenclature of, of compounds. Um, let's do iron, Fe2, I'm not gonna say the name, I'm gonna spoil it. Okay, so they tell me, name this compound. Okay, so the procedure is the same as we did before. Three returns, two goes back up, right? So Fe plus three, and then O minus two. Okay, so now here is the point where you have to double check that this element has only one charge or multiple charges. In this case, you look at iron. Iron has plus two and plus three. So you have two possible charges. So can I just simply say like iron oxide? No, I cannot say just simple iron oxide because I don't know if I'm using iron two or if I'm using iron three. Okay? Because as you can see here, iron has two charges. How can I double check that I have iron two and iron three? Well, you say it, well, the name is going to be iron three oxide. 
three in Roman numbers? Yeah, in Roman numbers. So it has to be Roman numerals. So in this case, how, why do I put three? Because I'm using the charge. The charge is plus three. Don't put this number. You say like, oh, Fe2, that means that is Fe uh, iron two. No, it's not iron two. Remember here, you have to cross the, the, the subscripts. Okay? So that's what makes the difference between uh, mean D plus two and D plus three, okay? So iron three oxide. What are, why oxide? Well, because remember, this is an anion. By the way, you also have to check that your anion makes sense. Oxygen minus two. Does oxygen have minus two? Yes, it, it has minus two. Another example, let's do copper sulfite. I just say the name, but we're just going to go through the procedure. Okay, so here, one and one, return charges, copper plus one, S minus one, right? If I return it, I have to double check. Does copper, can copper do plus one? Yes, copper can do plus one. Can sulfur do minus one? No, I just noticed that sulfur can do minus one. Sulfur can do minus two. So if there is something wrong here, no, it is not wrong. Is that this particular compound went through simplification. If sulfur plus, it doesn't exist as minus one, it exists as minus two, that means that this guy should actually be minus two. And since I'm timing this by two, this one also has to be timed by two. Don't forget to time the other one also by two. Both. Can copper be plus two? Yes, copper can be plus two. Okay, makes sense now. This is the checkpoint that you always have to make sure that you're an ion and you are you got ion, they make sense. Make sense refer to what? They make sense to the possibilities from the periodic table. Okay. What's the name of this guy? This is called copper two in Roman numbers, right? And this guy now, this guy exists. Now this guy is sulfite. Copper two sulfite. This is iron three oxide. Okay. Another one for this, let's do, let's do PV. Um, okay. okay, PVCl2, very common compound. Okay. Same thing, return, return, PV plus two, Cl minus one. Double check, can PV, can let B plus two? Yes, right, plus two plus four, good. Can chlorine be minus one? Yes, chlorine can be minus one, great. So no timing, right? You don't have to multiply by anything. So what's the name of this guy? Well, lead has multiple charges, plus two and plus four. If it has multiple charges, then I have to specify lead two. I'm using lead two here. Lead two, and the name of this guy is chloride. Good. Okay. Now formulation, right? We did nomenclature first. Now we're gonna do formulation. Formulation is actually better, it's easier, a little bit easier. Okay. So they tell me uh, gold, write the formula of gold three sulfite. Okay, uh, symbol of gold three, Au plus three, right? Symbol of sulfite, S minus two. How do I get that? Well, gold, I know that gold is Au, uh, right here. And I don't even have to look at the charge, right? Because here it's telling me gold three. Gold three because it's the Roman number, AU3. Sulfite, sulfite, the only negative charge for sulf sulfur is minus two. So it's by this. Cross AU2S3. Should I simplify? No, because two and three. So this one is my final answer. Okay. Uh, another one. Uh, strontium, no, strontium doesn't have multiple. Cobalt, cobalt two phosphite. Okay, cobalt two phosphite. Symbol of cobalt, CO. Here they're telling me plus two, right? I don't even have to look at the charge because here they're telling me plus two. Phosphite, P. What is the negative charge of phosphide? Phosphide is minus three. It's plus three plus five minus three. So the only option for phosphide is minus three. Cross CO3P2. That will be the formula for 
uh, cobalt phosphide. Okay, okay. great. So <clears throat> the next part, uh, the next uh, type of compounds which are uh, for this type of ionic compounds are what we call the polyatomic ions. Okay? So it's another very important. In polyatomic ions, at least since we are an online uh, class, I mean, you guys have, you can take your exams definitely with an open book, right? But there is a chart that you guys have to study, theoretically, on a face-to-face. -face. On a face-to-face, -face, you will have to memorize it. But in this case, we don't have to memorize anything. So I'm here, I have the table, uh, let me, you can see that here, yes. Okay. Table 2.5 on chapter 58. This is a chap, uh, page 58 of this, of this book. Again, it, it might change from edition to edition. This is the 10th edition. Uh, in the future, I mean, if it comes up the 11th or the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th edition, yeah, definitely will be changed a different page, but the table doesn't change. It's uh, table 2.5. Here you will have uh, names of polyatomic ions. For example, NH4 plus is called ammonium. NO2 minus is nitride. Nitrate is NO3. They each have a different name, okay? Normally, we'll have to memorize these names and these formulas, but in your case, you don't have to memorize them, right? But definitely, with practice, I mean, believe me, for example, how long did it take me to memorize all this? Uh, less than a semester. Uh, well, in my case, we have to memorize it, I mean, no matter what, but uh, it doesn't take you too long because it is really the practice what makes you really, those things will stick to your, to your head uh, once, um, once we have, I mean, we use it a lot, right? Depending on the, how often you use it, that you definitely stick to these to these names. Okay, so don't forget table two point two point five for your polyatomic ions. Okay, so they tell me write the formula of the compound silver chlorate. Okay, and by the way, how do I recognize these ions? Right, that I have polyatomic ions. Well. First, because they are on the table, right? When you have to do this formulation, you have to see the top of the table next to you. Chlorate doesn't sound familiar because if it would be Cl minus, we know that Cl minus is chloride. But this time it's not chloride, it's chlorate, A-T-E ending. So I have to, I know that A-G, right, is for silver. Now, chlorate, if you go to the table, I mean, I'm looking at it right now, but Cl chlorate is ClO3 minus. This is the polyatomic ion. The whole thing is called chlorate, ClO3. What if I remove like ClO, then it's not chlorate anymore, it's something else. What if I take out the, the chlorine and Cl3? No, no, that's no. The chlorate is ClO3. And then I will, I will treat it as a whole thing. So this one is minus one, Clean, clean, right? Move the charges. Ag1 parenthesis ClO3 one, right? So that's really what it, what it would be. You, you write it like this, right? This one is affecting the whole ClO3, and this one is affecting the silver. Ones are never written. If there is no numbers, then you can you write it as a single. So eliminate the ones and also eliminate the parenthesis. You can write Ag ClO3. Okay. Next example, calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is a main component for chalk. I don't use chalk in these days anymore, but chalk is made of calcium carbonate. It's a very insoluble substance. Okay. Calcium carbonate, calcium, Ca plus two, right? I know that from the periodic table. Carbonate, if I look at the polyatomic ion table, carbonate is CO3 minus two. Cross, if I cross charges, Ca2, CO3, 2, right? Makes sense, right? 2 affects the whole carbonate, but this time the 2 cancel out. I can simplify. If I simplify them to 1, then I can also simplify the parentheses. That would be my, my, my answer, CaCO3. Let's use one that 
it really needs the the parentheses um copper copper to nitrate mm, yeah okay copper to nitrate symbol of copper well cu plus two how do i know it's plus two because it's telling me copper two nitrate if you go to the table you will find out that nitrate is n of three to the minus one okay cross cu one parenthesis n of three two can I simplify? No, because I will have one and two, but the one, I can get rid of the one. This could be my answer. Okay. Great. Now, that was, this one was uh, nomenclature. Now let's do formulation. Formulation is the opposite. Um, no, sorry, this one was formulation. Now we have to do nomenclature or naming. So now let's say that they tell me um, barium BA. Okay. Just thinking what example it can be good. Um, yeah, this formula. Okay. So what should I do? Well, return, return, return. BA plus two and PO4 minus three. Now that's the point where you have to double check. Can barium be plus two? Barium is right here. Barium has plus two. Good. Does PO4 minus three exist? Okay, that's another check that you have to do here. Do I find it? Yes, I find it right here. PO4 minus three is called phosphate. Okay, so it does exist. So the name is going to be barium phosphate. All right. Another formula, okay, let's use this one. I haven't used it. Um, okay, FECN3. -E so return, this is a one, return FE plus three, right? Cn minus one. Double check. Can iron be plus three? Yes, but actually it has two two possible charges, plus one plus three, but plus three is an option, so it works. Cn minus, that Cn minus exists, well go to the table and you will find out that Cn minus exists, which is called cyanide. Why no cyanate? Well, cyanate is something else. So just use whatever name is on the table. Okay? So don't change, don't try to change the name. So this one exists. So it would be iron three cyanide. Okay. Cyanide because the name is telling me cyanide. The table is telling me cyanide. Why iron three? Because iron is a multiple, right? It has it has different charges. That's why I'm, I have to specify. You say like, is it wrong if I said barium two? Yes, it is wrong if you say barium two. Why? Because by saying barium two, you are you are also saying that barium has more than one charge, and that's not the case. Barium only has one charge. Okay? If it has no, it's only one charge. Then just flat name. So that's it. If you have multiple multiple charges, then you specify it. Okay. Don't forget that. Okay. Great. So. We're done with inorganic compounds, I mean inorganic naming. Now let's go to covalent. Let's go to covalent. Covalent is actually easier, covalent compounds. Remember in covalent compounds, we have a non-metal plus a non-metal, right? That's how they, they form. Um, normally, uh, they they are organized based on the electronegativity. Electronegativity is a property of compounds that they tend to pull electrons. They attract electrons stronger. 
but that's a property of, uh, that we will see later. Okay? So covalent compounds is, is only named based on prefixes. For number one, it's mono. For number two, is di. Number three, right, is tri. Tetra. Penta. I mean, it's very geometric after this. Hexa. Uh, hepta, octa, nona, right? So we are using these prefixes. Okay. But remember that you have to first identify that you have no metals. That's the key point. That's the starting point for this for this particular uh, nomenclature. Okay? So is that that you have to first recognize that you're in front of a of a covalent compound. Okay. So let's say that I have this. SO2. In this case, I am in front of a covalent compound because sulfur is a non metal and oxygen is also a non metal. How do I know that? Because they are on the right side of the zigzag line. Sulfur is here and oxygen is right here. Right? So they are both non metals. So I'm going to use the prefixes. For the first element, okay, never use mono. If, right, if you have to use mono, never use mono for the first one. Because here, how many sulfurs do I have? I have one. According to this, I should say mono sulfur, but you never say it for the first one. So in this case, I would just say sulfur. Okay? How many oxygens do I have? I have two oxygens. The prefix for oxygen for two is di. So sulfur dioxide. Okay? Know that, right? dioxide. Uh, I have to use the ID ending, yes, because you have an, an anion. Let's see the next one, P2O5. What is P? P is sulfur, but in this case it's two. So if it's two, I have to say di. Diphosphorus, I'm gonna write it smaller. Diphosphorus, because it's two phosphorus. How many oxygens? Five, pentoxide. Diphosphorus pentoxide because it's five of them. The prefix for five is penta. Well, you contract it, right? Don't say pentaoxide, no, it's pentoxide. Okay? Uh, another one, uh, Cl207. Dichloro. Okay? Because it's two chlorines. Heptoxide. Now, this is a question, right? Why do you call it chloro? The name of Cl is chlorine. Why chloro? Because halogens are special. Halogens are picky. They, in naming, when, you are, when they are combined, they don't like to be called fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. No. So if you have fluorine, it will be called fluoro. Chlorine will be called chloro, bromine will be called bromo, and iodine is called iodo. Okay, so those are the names if halogens, right? They are combined. Uh, that was nomenclature. Now let's do formula. Uh, let's see. Carbon tetrachloride. dihydrogen oxide mm. dinitrogen trisulfite okay carbon tetrachloride carbon okay there is no prefix that means it's only one carbon Tetrachloride, that means that it's four chlorines, CCL4. Good. Dihydrogen. Oxide or monoxide, right? You can call it also. It really should be monoxide. 
you can see that this one, we know this formula, right? I mean, this compound is called water. Normally, the common name is water, but the real name is dihydrogen monoxide. So next time you can say like, oh, I, will, I want to leak some hydrogen, dihydrogen monoxide, because that's really the official name of H2O. Dinitrogen trisulfide. Okay, that's what you use. Can I simplify here too? Yeah, you can also simplify in 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 right, in this particular uh, compounds, but let's just leave it like that for now. As I said, the covalent compounds are easier for the naming. It's only about prefixes, the tri, tetra. Do we have to memorize this? I mean, theoretically yes, but they're very straightforward. I mean, to to remember these values, right? So let's continue now with the presentation. Okay. So here definitely they will tell you the, the rules. Just please read this ones. But basically they are all gonna go over the same principles I've been using. Potassium chloride, magnesium bromide, calcium oxide, right? This is the type two when you have more than one charge. Right? More than one type of positive charge. That's what I was saying with the periodic table. You always have to have the periodic table at hand. Transition metal cations always Require, right? Usually require uh, a Roman numeral. So that Roman numeral that's the one that I was saying. Here will be some examples: copper one bromide, iron two sulfide, lead four oxide. Full atomic ions. So see table two point five in textbook, right? For this ten edition is page fifty eight, but depending on the edition that you have, uh, it might change. But it's always going to be table two point five: hydroxide, nitrate, sulfate, right? Okay, here more rules. That's now we are covalent, carbon dioxide, so forth. Right? Here are some overall strategies. Flocha for naming binary compounds. Acids. Acids are the a specific type of compounds that, as we know, they are, they are corrosive. Uh, they have a sour taste, right? So those are a few of the properties of acids. But the best way how to identify an acid is that you will always see an hydrogen at the beginning. So for example, HCl, HBr, HF, HNO3, H2SO4. In some cases, you might see one hydrogen, two hydrogens, three hydrogens. Okay? So molecule, uh, how to name these acids? Well, um, it depends um, on the type. For example, here we have hydrochloric acid. Right? Normally that is for, for the halogens. Hydrochloric acid for chlorine for hydrocyanic acid, uh, you change the ending. Okay? So remember that before Cl used to be called chloride, but when it's in an acid, it will be called hydrochloric, hydrochloric. The hydro is because of the H. The chloric is because it's Cl in an acid. It's hydrochloric, cyanic, sulfuric, hydrosulfuric acid. Okay? What if the if it contains oxygen, right? So here are the ones that do not contain oxygen. You have to use the hydro, 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 right, as a prefix, and the ending here. The hydro is a prefix, and the ending is IC. If it, that is if the acid doesn't have a, an oxygen. If the acid has an oxygen, then the ending normally you will see as eight, but then you again change it to IC. Right? So why is that? Uh, I will show you here, right? For example, all these ions, this here, okay? So the ATE, this perchlorate is Cl4 or minus, right? So to change that to an acid, right? To change that to an acid, it would be, I'm just talking about this Cl4, right? It would be HCl4 in the acid version of that. So if it's the acid version, it's not gonna be called perchlorate acid. It's going to be called perchloric acid. By the way, perchloric acid is one of the strongest acids that we have in nature, HClO4. What about oxalate, right? In this case, it has a minus two charge. Then you will have to do H2C2O4. Right? You, are, you are adding as many hydrogens as negative charge it has. So now this one used to be called oxalate. 
then it's going to be called oxalic acid. You see the ATE ending is called, it changed to IC. Acetate, acetate, according to this, acetate is C2, H3O2 minus, that's acetate. What if I want to make the acetic acid, which is vinegar, right, by the way. So you add as many hydrogens as the charge. See, this is a minus one charge, so that minus one charge now becomes a hydrogen. The rest is the same. The ending changes from ATE to IC, acetic acid. Chloride will be chlorous, chlorous acid. Yeah, so the ATE ending changes to IC, and the IT ending changes to O's. Okay? So in this case, chlorate will be chloric acid. Perchlorate, perchloric acid, acetic acid, permanganic acid, dichromic acid, chromic acid, uh, no, peroxide, no, that doesn't, doesn't, it's not from an acid, oxalic acid, thiosulfuric acid, okay? What about this ITE? Chlorus, chlorus acid, hypochlorus, hypochlorous acid, carbonic acid, bicarbonate, no, that's not an acid, okay? So some of the acids, uh, uh, thiocyan, thios, thiocyanic acid, phosphoric acid, another AT, sulfuric acid, sulfurous acid, nitric acid, nitrous acid. Okay? So those could be some examples for the uh, for the acids that you will have. I mean, in this case. Okay? So let's go back to the, the slide. We're almost done. Uh, Nitric acid, um, sulfuric acid, acetic acid. Okay? So if the nion the not is O's, right? So that's exactly what I was saying. That if it's the IT, right? this ending changes now to O's. Nitrous acid, sulfurous acid, chlorous acid. Okay? So here is some uh, flow chart for naming acid. Um, that's all I have for now. Um, again, I will have more questions posted as YouTube videos. Please take a look and let me know if you guys have any questions.